All right, so for this class, this is kind of your intro to art. We're going to go into what it is, why it is, how it is, and then we're going to try to define art. Um, but first, we're going to look at what art is. To figure that out, first we have to look at why people create art. Why? Why do people create art? To express something, yeah, absolutely. Anyone else have anything? Yeah. Tell a story. Tell a story. What else? Think about church. Out of devotion. Mm -hmm. So we'll look at it from a not necessarily Catholic point of view, just for a second, because there's multiple different religions that all create art. Every religion creates art, right? So. To make our definition as broad as possible, we can say out of devotion, right? Out of religious devotion. Um, obviously, we do it as Catholics, and we're going to be looking at quite a bit of Catholic art. But those are, those are three of the reasons. So good job. So why do people create art? Um, the first one is just, and so you'll want to fill this in on your, on your handout or put it in your notes. Uh, these are your five reasons to create. Are these for us, or do we hand them back to you at any point? The handouts? Yeah. Those are yours. You can keep them for 40 years if you really want to. Okay, the first reason is just because people want to create something. It's as simple as that. As humans, we have an innate need and an innate desire to create things, to create something that is not us. It's as simple as that, to create, because we're human. We're looking at some of the earliest artwork that has been known to man. These are the cave paintings. Uh, commonly known as cave paintings. These exist all throughout Europe. Uh, we'll look at these examples more in depth in the next class. Um, mostly in Europe, although there's a couple in Libya as well. And we don't really know why they did this. I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but we don't really know why these people created these, these works of art. Uh, the best reason we can give for these is just because they wanted to, and they could, right? Humans are able to do things that animals aren't. No animal ever creates art, okay? Second, Second reason, to decorate, to make the boring more special. Okay? This is what we commonly call decorative arts, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. Um, one, people actually debate whether or not this is quote unquote art or not, right? Because is it meant to be art or is it meant to be decoration, right? But broadly, it's to decorate, to make things look more interesting. Um, these rock um, drawings here in Arizona. Uh, we know why these, these indigenous people did these. It was just purely to decorate. There was no religious symbolism or anything. We, we can tell from word of mouth, uh, from, their, um, from their stories going back hundreds, thousands of years, that they did it simply because they wanted to decorate. The third answer, out of devotion, to show adoration or to explain mysteries of the divine. Obviously, we see this with Christian art, but there's all t sorts of different Christ kinds of Christian art. Um, again, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but this is the first known depiction of our Lord Jesus Christ in the catacombs of St. Of Saint Priscilla. You notice some things that are definitely missing, like a beard, like stigmata in the hands, none of the marks of the passion. All right? We'll get into why that is and why they, why they depicted our Lord in this way, um, but the very earliest depictions of our Lord were done as the Good Shepherd. We'll get into that. Okay? But to explain mysteries of the divine. This is, again, another sarcophagus carving from Rome. Basilica of St. Sophia in Rome. We'll get into this here this semester as well. Okay. Fourth reason, to tell a story. I think someone said that, to tell a story. Um, there's this whole subgenre of paintings called history paintings. Paintings that tell a story, tell something that happened. Sometimes very truthfully, sometimes not so truthfully. That's where we get the term artistic license, where the artist gets to kind of explain things in a slightly different way, and they kind of whitewash a little bit of history. We'll talk about that more next year, but history paintings. Um, this is telling a story or interesting depictions of nature from other places. Seniors, you know this one. We talked quite a bit about this one last year, right? This is a history painting. Right? This is telling a story of something that happened. And then we talked about the effects that it had and the power that this artwork, artwork had. But art can be very simple, almost documentary. Right? Interesting depictions of nature from other places. 
This is a Renaissance study of non-native plants, right? We had an artist who was traveling around to different places and uh, explaining for people back home, this is what these plants look like. Oh, that's wild, but think about it. They didn't have photos. They had no way of knowing what was going on. And if you tried to travel with these plants, they all die. So this is the only way many people saw these different plants. And fifth, to share an emotion, any emotion, to try and express love, fear, sadness, surprise, happiness, right? This is kind of the most intangible of the five reasons why we create art. Uh, and this is one that has really driven artists, especially in the last four or 500 years. How do we express something that we can't really express in any other way, right? Previous one was love, this one was fear, right? Seniors, we, we looked at this one quite a bit. Okay, so this is why people create art. Humans are the only people that do art. You can see uh, videos of you know, elephants with a paintbrush and they're doing stuff on a, on a canvas. They're not really creating art. They're doing it for the treats. Um, it's not. They're not doing it for the innate desire to create art. We're the only people, we're the only animals that do that. All right, so what are the types of art? There's all different types of art. We are mainly going to be talking um, about visual art this, this year and during these next two years, visual arts. Um, what are some non-visual arts? Music. Music. What else? Singing, Singing music. <laughs> Seniors, we studied Degas. What did Degas always sculpt? He always did sculptures of ba bal ballerina dance dance it's performance art performance art it's not technically considered visual arts technically air quotes okay okay it's visual but it's not considered it's not in the thing of visual arts it's performance art just like acting acting movies those are kind of not really considered visual arts either yeah Music is not. Music is not. So we're talking about things that are not visual arts. All right, so let's talk about visual arts. Is dance and so dance visual It is not. You can still see it. Acting, you can still see it, but that's not considered visual arts either. That's... So the only thing that's considered visual arts is sculpture and paintings. Sculptures, paintings, architecture. Okay. So what are our visual arts? We have to, we have to s further subdivide these into... Two-dimensional and three-dimensional, makes sense. 2D, flat, 3D, 3D, okay. Um, within two-dimensional, we have painting, drawing, printmaking. We'll talk about what printmaking is, juniors. It's different from drawing. It looks very similar to drawing, but it's not. Tapestry and weaving. That's two-dimensional art. Next, we get into three-dimensional art, obviously sculpture. This is what's called in the round, right? You can walk around it and see all of it, see, see it from all sides. But still three-dimensional, but a little bit more 2D is wood carving, right? You can only see it from one vantage point, but it still sticks out, right? That's all one piece of wood. Notice how it's... Oh my gosh, she's under it. Yeah. He's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, he's under it. Okay. And then we have architecture. Architecture can be considered art. Sometimes it's not. Again, we'll get into, into those distinctions later. And then finally, we have this whole other category within visual arts called decorative arts. Uh, this came about especially in the early 20th century, late 19th century. Um, and artisans, people who were creating things like this, really wanted to push for these types of objects to be considered art. And they said, well, there's a lot of skill, there's a lot of effort that goes into them. There's kind of that pushback of, well, it's a clock. Yes, but it's a beautiful clock. Yeah, it's a clock. Okay, so we can have our own opinions on whether or not this is art or arts. Um, most people just put this in the category of decorative art compared to fine arts, right? So there's fine arts and decorative arts. People can argue about the, the distinctions all day long. 
Um, but that's kind of a handy category to put these things in, decorative arts. Then how would you not consider like a paint that's decorative arts like put it in your house? We'll, get, we'll talk about that when we talk about the definition. We'll get back. Yeah. So visual arts is 2D, uh, mm -hmm. 3D, and then decorative arts. And decorative arts. Yep. So there's a bowl, but it's done very beautifully. Okay, so it's a decorative art. It's a couch. Probably even a little bit uncomfortable to sit on yeah, because it's exactly. done so decoratively. Right, so that's definitely more on the side of fine arts than it is decorative arts. See, everything is kind of on a spectrum. It's kind of on a continuum. If you just have a regular couch, that's not art. But this could be. It's kind of like the less useful it is, the more art it is. That's kind of your broad definition of, of it, OK? But again, we, we just kind of get call these things decorative arts. Yeah? So if you keep fake plants in your house that like, have a really good base or something, is that decorative art? Yeah, sort of. But that is a work of decorative art. It serves no function other than to decorate. There's no function to it, right? But what is, why are you putting flowers in it oh, to decorate? Uh, the base, well, like a base there. Yeah, so like, you know, that little thing there. Oh, yeah. That's decorative. There's no purpose for it. We don't need it there, right? Okay, so let's get into what is art. Um, we need a definition before we move forward. <clears throat> so kind of the, the, the little speech I give at, at this lecture every time is, you are either lucky or unlucky that you have me as a teacher um, and I would say that about you having any teacher. Um, you're going to be biased by me and what I think. It doesn't mean you can't come up with your own ideas and opinions and thoughts about this kind of stuff. Um, when I was studying art history in college and as I've continued to study it over time, there are myriad definitions of what art is. Um, art can, definitions can be very simple, they can be very complex. Mine is a little bit more complex because I like to have things very clear and categorized and I hate this really subjective, well, art is whatever you want it to be. No, no, we need to have some objectivity, right? Um, so we need a definition. This is my definition. I want you to learn my definition. You can come up with your own, but for this class, we're gonna use mine because it's my class. So there you go. Uh, before we do that, actually, let's go through some of these various definitions of art. Um, Plato, so this is in chronological order. Plato, art is the unceasing effort to compete with the beauty of flowers and never succeeding. Very nice, very poetic, but doesn't really tell us what art is. Dictionary from the, from the 1300s. Art is skill. It's display, application, or expression. Cool, but someone who's building a cinder block wall fits those categories, too. They're skillful. Dictionary from 1600s, the expression or application of creative skill and imagination typically in a visible for visual form such as painting, drawing, or sculpture producing words to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. This is probably about as close to a good definition as I think there is from someone other than what we've developed. James McNeil Whistler, who was a, an, uh, an American painter in 1890, the craftsman knows what he wants to make before he makes it. The making of a work of art is a strange and risky business in which the maker never quite knows what he's making until he makes it. Again, cool. It's a great, great little treatise about the struggles that the artist goes through. It doesn't really tell us much about what art is. Paul Gauguin says, art is filling a space in a beautiful way. That's what art means to me. So if I fill a room with a bunch of models, yeah. is that art? I'm filling a space in a beautiful way. I mean, it doesn't work, right? Frank Lloyd Wright. American Architect, 1957. Art is a discovery and development of elementary principles of nature in a beautiful form suitable for human use. 100% disagree with Frank Lloyd right here. Great architect, crappy definition. Uh, because he says the word use. Art should not be useful. It doesn't make sense for it to be useful. A painting hanging on a wall is not useful. It provides joy, but it doesn't provide us utility, right? We can't do anything with it other than if we're broke, use it for firewood. Huh? Right? That's the only utility you can get out of a painting. Peter Sells, 1981, he's a modern artist. If one general statement can be made about the art of our times, it's that one by one the old criteria of what a work of art ought to have been 
discarded in favor of a dynamic approach in which everything is possible. So now we can start to see how modern artists are saying, well, anything is possible with art. And yes, anything is possible with art, but that doesn't mean that we can call anything and everything art. That doesn't make sense. Finally, today's dictionary, Wikipedia, the expression or application of human creative skill and imagination, typically in a visual form, such as painting or sculpture, producing works to be appreciated primarily for their beauty or emotional power. Very similar to the 1600s definition. So we can see how even today we still need to have some sort of a clear definition. Finally, Marcel Duchamp, seniors, you know who he is. He totally defined art by turning it on his head. We'll get to that more next year, juniors. He took a urinal and said it's art. Nineteen eighteen. Armut nineteen eighteen. And called it fountain and put it in a museum. And he said, This is art. He said it's a power. Cool. Um Okay. All right, great. All right, so here's my definition. You're definitely gonna want to know at least the underlined parts. So if you want to underline that on your handout or highlight them or whatever you want to do. Art is a creative expression. We're going to read through it and then we're going to go through each, each bit of it. Art is a creative expression using physical materials manipulated by an artist for people to see. Its purpose should be mostly artistic and should convey beauty or at the least leave the viewer with a net positive experience. Creative expression using physical materials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So when you go to the Phoenix Art Museum and like a section of their modern art, they have this box, and in the box is hay barrels, and they just slowly go up in size, and that's art. Who, like, how does that fit into this definition of art? It is a creative expression, so we have an intent behind it, okay. Physical materials, yep, manipulated, he changed them. An artist did it, it's not natural. You can see it, purpose is artistic. It's not useful, okay? Should convey beauty or at the least leave a viewer with a net positive experience. That's where we can have some subjective opinions about whether or not that's art or not. It's not about like, it's about can you appreciate it? Can you understand it? Can you, can you appreciate it for what it is, right? So, and this is what kind of this class is trying to teach you to do. It's trying to teach you to not go into a museum and go, I don't understand that, therefore I don't like it, therefore it's not art. That's unfair, right? You can't just go, just because I don't like it, it's not art. Mm, no. You can not like it. I don't care if you don't like it, but you don't get to say it's not art or it is art just based on that, right? So, and that's what this class is going to kind of teach you to do. Yeah. So is that like when people have like a big thing, like a canvas that they just splatted art on? They yeah. They stare in front of it and try to like depict what it is. Jackson Pollock, top left yep. of postmodern. Yep. Yeah, that's like, so that would be the net positive experience. So right. Right. It's not beautiful. That top left one is not beautiful. I don't think anyone would say it's beautiful unless you're, you know, you have some schizophrenia going on. But <laughs> does it leave you with a net positive experience? All right. So let's go through each of these. Um, it's creative, right? Norman Rockwell, right? It's creative. He took a lot of photos of these scenes. And we talked about this a little bit last year, seniors. He took a lot of photos of these scenes, and then he would kind of manipulate them and create them. And he would add some of his own touches to them. Right? That's creative. Using physical materials. Right? An artist can't just say something and then it be art. It has to be something tangible. Right? Makes sense? Huh? Oh, that's a, that's a marble. That's a mine of marble where they're quarrying marble. So you have to use physical materials, whether it's paint. And we can stretch the definition a little bit, like you said, about uh, digital, digital art. Right? We can stretch that a little bit. Manipulated by an artist. An artist has to do something, right? Even Marcel Duchamp with his urinal, he put it on its side and he painted something on it. He did manipulate it. Okay, but whatever. Has to be, people have to be able to see it, right? So this is an x-ray of a work of art where there's a second work of art underneath. Artists, especially in the Renaissance and Baroque period, used to do this a lot. They would start a painting, they didn't like it, then they would just put white over it and start again. 
right? And so you'll have these masterpieces. Oh my gosh, there's a lost masterpiece of Van Gogh or of Rembrandt. So that's the one that's under it? That's the one that's under it. Well, you can kind of see both at the same time. Yeah. So it's an x-ray, so people are able to see it um, now. But we can't call that interior, that first work of art, we can't really call that art because no one can see it, right? And I'm not talking about if it's hidden away in a safe or something, that's still art. But if it's destroyed or removed or painted over, it's not art. People have to see it. Its purpose is mostly art. So this is where we get a little bit tricky, especially with decorative arts. Is this purpose mostly art or is it mostly utility? Should we call this a work of art or should we call this just a very nicely designed couch or interestingly designed couch, depending on how you want to look at it? Up for interpretation, right? Yeah. Its purpose is mostly art. Um, okay, sure. Sure, I would probably call this art because every single aspect of it is kind of unnecessary. This is kind of how you can tell whether something is mostly art or not, or its purpose is mostly art. Is it sort of unnecessary or mostly necessary? Right? We are going to kind of contradict ourselves by looking at a lot of architecture. Architecture is mostly utility. It's a building. Um, but throughout history, it always has been considered art. It always has, architecture has been considered part of the fine arts, so we're just going to go with that and do that. Um, but we're kind of contradicting ourselves a little bit there. <clears throat> Leaves the viewer with a net positive experience. Water lilies. Right, Monet. Leaves the viewer with a net positive experience. It can be beauty. But here's where we get tricky. Again, its purpose should be mostly beautiful or mostly beautiful or leave the viewer with a net positive experience. Um, what's beautiful to Rachel is not going to be beautiful to Maria. They might agree on 80% of the things, but not the other 20%, right? So we can't just say, well, it has to be beautiful. No. So we have to come up with a different term. That's why I came up with net positive experience. Does it leave you walking away feeling better or feeling worse? Does it leave you walking away learning something or reflecting on something or even if it's sadness or even if the work is ugly but man that was good for me to see that's still a net positive experience so on um, like who made the was it Goya that made the black yes so on those ones like I don't think you come away after seeing one of those and be like oh I feel better that, that Think of it this yeah. Think of it the same way as watching a horror movie. If you're into horror, right? Are you into horror? Yes. Was that a great movie? That was a great movie. Was it nice? Was it pretty? Was it beautiful? Not in the slightest, but it was great. <laughs> okay. Same sort of thing there. Um, you're walking away with that being enriched a little bit. You learned something about what Goya was trying to do, and it was shocking and it was crazy, but you walked away feeling, whoa, here's, Evan, no? Oh, I thought you were, okay. Kathy Kolwitz, seniors, we learned about her last year. She's one of my favorite artists. She's, she's up there too in, in modern art. Um, she's one of my favorite artists. This is haunting. This is horrifying, right? She did a bunch of these prints and these drawings during the period of the, of the wars in Germany, when life was awful, people were starving. Children couldn't eat, mothers couldn't help them. And so she made these prints in order to distribute to the world to say, this is what's happening here in Germany. The politicians aren't telling you this. It was a very powerful series of works that she did. Even though this is sad, even though this makes you kind of feel, if you have a heart, it makes you kind of feel like you have a pit in your stomach, it's still a net positive experience. Why? Because we're able to learn something about what is going on here. It's kind of like a documentary, right? So I would still consider this a net positive experience. So it's art if you walk away, you feel something? You feel something. I would say disgust, no, right? Disgust is never a net positive experience. But if you walk away after seeing this and going, man, I need to reflect on, man, you know, that sort of thing, that's, that builds you up, right? That makes you a better person. Are you a better person for having seen this or not? That's probably a better way to describe it. Are you a better person for having seen this work of art or not? Do you want to be better or do you think better or does that make sense? 
we're getting into a lot of intangibles here, getting into some philosophy that's kind of hard to pinpoint, but that's kind of where we are. So that's my definition of art. Um, as many different art historians as there are, they have different definitions of art. So this is mine. You come up with your own, I'd love to hear it. Okay, how do we study art? This is gonna be your handout. We're gonna be looking at this. Um, I'd like you to read this by Wednesday, so this is your reading handout. This basically goes into a lot more detail about what we're talking about here. These four main things, form, content, function, and context. So how do we study art? We're gonna be looking at form, content, function, and context. And I'm gonna be mentioning these words th to you throughout the entire time, especially in very early art, when we're trying to understand something about the people, and we don't understand very much about the people other than from what they've left behind. This is how we learn about the ancient peoples, is through the things they left behind, and a lot of it is through their art. We're not gonna be looking at tools, or we're not gonna be looking at settlements, we'll look at a little bit of those, um, but we're really looking at, at, at their objects. So first, form, what do I mean by form? Literally, it is the component materials and how they're employed to create physical and visual elements that coalesce into a work of art, right? What's the work of art made out of? What's the form? So when we say, what's the form? We're saying, it's oil paint on canvas. It's acrylic on wood. It's metal sculpture. It's limestone, big blocks, right? That's the form. You don't need to know, by the way, you don't need to know this word for word. I'm, juniors, if um, you haven't had me before, I'm not gonna be asking, all right, give me the definition of form, and I'm not gonna be taking off point. But I want you to broadly know what form is, right? So if, if I said, what is form? And you answered, it's the stuff that a work of art is made out of. Good enough for me, okay? I just want you to understand it. So don't worry too much about writing down this word for word. I don't care. You wanna write it down, cool, you don't have to. Okay, content. So form content. Content is what's depicted. What is going on in the work of art or on the work of art. So these are interacting, communicative. Again, this is college level art history stuff. Don't worry too much about it. I'll explain it. Interacting communicative elements of design, representation, and presentation with a, within a work of art. Broadly, what's going on? What's, what is it? Right? So this is a piece of stone, that's the form. It's carved, that's form. What's the content? It's a pharaoh, pointy hat, Ra, sun god, hieroglyphics, right? This, right, that's content. So it's these interactive communicative elements of design. These, these elements on the work of art are communicating to us something, right? Could be communicating to us something of devotion, right? We go back to our reasons why people create art. Devotion, history, um, you know, sadness, happiness, right? It's communicating to us something. And so it's all these elements put together, they tell us something, or they give us a feeling of something. Next is function. Function includes the artist's intended uses of the work, which can change according to the context of the audience, time, location, and culture. So function, why did the artist create it? Was it meant to be a devotional image? Was it meant to be right here in this spot? Was the Pieta meant to be in this niche as you walk into St. Peter's just off to the right? Did he mean it to be there? Or did he mean it to be outside? Was it meant to be a ceremonial thing for ancient Mesopotamian peoples? And now it's in the British Museum of Art. Does that change how we view the work of art? Absolutely. So we have to understand what the original intent of the artist was. What was the original idea behind this work of art? for us to truly understand what the work of art is. I, lo I love museums, I love going into them, but they're very sterile sometimes because again, especially with ancient stuff, you go into the Phoenix Museum of Art uh, and there's this uh, Mesopotamian huge stone carving right when you walk in. Super cool, great to see, but what are you missing? The function, the content, right, the function. Function is closely related to context, right, context. Was this lion meant to be outside of a city gate or was it meant to be in the Phoenix Art Museum? We obviously know the answer. Can we still appreciate it for what it is even if it's in the Phoenix Museum? Sure we can, uh, but we still have to understand the context. So context, context includes original and subsequent historical and cultural mil milieu of a work of art. Basically, 
what was going on, not, not only where was this meant to be, that's more the function, but context. Who painted this and when? What was he thinking or she thinking when she, she or he painted it? This is Rothko, so it's a he. What was he thinking when he painted it? What was his intent behind it? Right? Can we learn something about the artist because of the work of art? We absolutely can. Right? That's why we'll spend some time, not so much this year, because there's just not a lot of um, artists that we know about, especially not in the first semester. Um, but as we get into next year, juniors and seniors, we've already had this, we talk quite a bit about the people behind the art, who created the art and why. Right? We talk about Caravaggio with his tortured past. We talk about Gentileschi and going through the trauma that she went through. And how did that inform in, in, in what she created? So that's the context. The context has to do a lot with not only the artist, but the period of time in which it was done. Okay? All right, so those are, those are the how. This is how we're going to be looking at art. And then finally, why. Why are you guys in this class? Other than, well, it was on my schedule when I showed up the first day of class, and Mr. Latham's on the board, and he wanted to teach it, and so Mrs. Graves had no choice but to let him teach it. No, it's not that. Uh, OK, it might be slightly that. Uh, no, it's not that. It is because for your entire, and basically, I'm not going to read through all this. Um, basically, those five bullet points down there, that's this. Okay. And I'm not going to ask you this on a test, so don't worry about it. This is me just telling you why or why are you here? And why do I want you to learn art? And why does Mrs. Graves think it's a good idea for you to learn art, art history? Because throughout your school career, all the way through 10th grade, certainly all the way through 8th grade, maybe 9th and 10th, you started to be able to kind of come up with your own opinions about things. For the majority of your um, school career so far, you've been given information, and then what? You have to give it back, right? We want to make sure that you know the information, and then you give it back to us. This class is not going to be as much like that. I'm going to be asking you questions about, give me your opinion on things, right? I want to know what's going on inside your head. And yes, there, there are going to be things. I can guarantee you, first test, definition of art is going to be on there, right? I, I, you're going to need to know that. And so there's going to be, need to be some stuff that you spit back. But see an image. You're going to need to be able to see an image. Unpack its meaning. Research the artist in the context. And then after you do all that, then you come to an opinion. And then finally, then you express it, right? So you're looking at something. OK, I don't like that. Let me understand a little bit more about it. OK, let me come up to an opinion about it. All right, now let me express it, right? So this is a process. It's a difficult process that you may not have had to do as often so far. But this is what we're going to be doing all the time in art history. And this is why it's an important class, OK? Because it's kind of a safe place. If you're wrong about Michelangelo, don't care. If you're wrong about theology, I do care, right? So you can be wrong in this class. You can have your own crazy opinions. That's awesome. Express them. Let me know, right? It's going to be very different from theology, OK? But this is the time for you to exercise those muscles of expressing your own opinion about things, OK? All right. Yes, please read that. I will see you tomorrow for theology.